In this video, we're going to talk about the different types of intermolecular forces that you need to know for LAMCAT. London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonds. To start, you need to understand that all intermolecular forces are electrostatic interactions. What that means is all of these interactions are between different charges. And since intermolecular forces are attractive, you're looking at interactions between a positive charge and a negative charge. Let's see how this works. To begin, we'll look at London dispersion forces. These are generally considered the weakest of, the, of all the intermolecular forces, but that's not completely true, and we're going to see why very soon. These forces are experienced by all molecules. So that means even molecules like water experience London dispersion forces. However, for molecules like water, London dispersion forces are not the predominant force that they experience. So we typically focus on those other forces that are dominant. For nonpolar molecules, these are the only interactions that they experience, which is why generally when you're thinking about London dispersion forces, you're thinking about nonpolar molecules. Another term that we have for London dispersion forces is instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces. And this term is actually much nicer in terms of describing how London dispersion forces work. So let's take a look at an example. We can have two nonpolar molecules like diatomic fluorine. And if you look at these two fluorine molecules that are attached to each other, what you can appreciate is that these molecules are nonpolar, which means they are not charged. They do not have charge separation. So in that case, if you don't have one side of the molecule that has a positive charge and the other with a negative charge, you might wonder, how can you possibly get an electrostatic interaction? So this is where the idea of the instantaneous dipole induced dipole comes in. Remember, when you're looking at an atom and you're thinking about the size of the atom, the radius, you're really considering the size of its electron cloud, right? So here I've essentially drawn the electron cloud for both of these molecules. And what we know is that electrons are not fixed in place. They're actually moving about freely. So they're just moving all around within this electron cloud. So it's actually possible by chance that for a very brief instant in time, all of the electrons just happen to aggregate on one side of the molecule. And if that happens, the molecule forms an instantaneous dipole where the side where the electrons aggregate has a very weak partial negative charge, and the other side where there's an absence of electron has a weak partial positive charge. Now, if at the same instant this instantaneous dipole is formed, it collides with another molecule, this partial negative charge is going to push electrons away. It's going to repel like charges. So in doing so, it's going to induce a very weak dipole in the other molecule. So now you have a partial negative charge with a partial positive charge, and that is the electrostatic interaction in London dispersion forces. So again, instantaneous dipole induced dipole interaction. Now, let's take a look at a few examples. So here we are looking at fluorine, and aside from fluorine, we can also consider chlorine, bromine, and iodine, right? All four of our halogens exist in their standard state as diatomic molecules. And all of them are nonpolar, so they only experience London dispersion forces. Now, what's interesting when you look at the different halogens, and you might recall when we were looking at our periodic groups, is that fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature, bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a solid at room temperature. And you might recall that the different physical properties that compounds have depend on the strength of the intermolecular forces. So the fact that iodine is a solid at room temperature means that iodine has the strongest intermolecular forces and fluorine has the weakest intermolecular forces. The reason why this is the case is because of a property called polarizability. Polarizability is essentially describing the ability of an atom to form these instantaneous dipoles. How 
uh, what is the ability of an atom or a molecule to have its electrons aggregate on one side to form an instantaneous dipole? And the strength of the dipole will depend on the number of electrons in the atom. And among these four halogens, iodine has the most electrons. So when all of the electrons swing over to one side, you're able to generate the strongest instantaneous dipoles and subsequently induced dipoles. So because of that, iodine has the strongest London dispersion forces and fluorine has the weakest. And so let's just first of all rank these. So this is gonna be increasing strength of the London dispersion forces. And the takeaway from this, that you know, this isn't just for halogens, this is for all molecules, is that London dispersion forces increase in strength with the size of the atom or molecule. And again, this is just because the larger the atom and the larger the molecule, the more electrons you have. And the more electrons you have, the more polarizable your molecule is. And then you can generate stronger instantaneous dipoles to form stronger London dispersion force interactions. Okay. Let's take a look at our next type of intermolecular force, which is dipole-dipole forces. These are interactions that are experienced by molecules with a permanent dipole. So that means it's not like the instantaneous dipole, which has to happen by chance. The dipole-dipole interaction is looking at molecules like HCl. So in HCl, we know that there's a permanent dipole. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so there is always a partial negative charge on the chlorine and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. So when you have other HCl molecules, they'll be able to experience an attractive electrostatic interaction between the partial negative charges and the partial positive charges. So that is the dipole-dipole interaction. All right. Our third type of intermolecular force is the hydrogen bond, which we often consider as the strongest intermolecular force. So hydrogen bonds to be to put them in order with our other intermolecular forces actually isn't a new type of intermolecular force. In fact, hydrogen bonds is simply just the strongest of all the dipole-dipole forces. And specifically, it's formed with a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. So what a hydrogen bond donor is, is a hydrogen that is bound to a very electronegative atom like fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And what's notable is that since these are the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, when hydrogen is attached to them, it's going to form a very strong partial positive charge. And to complete the hydrogen bond, the hydrogen bond donor needs to meet with a hydrogen bond acceptor, which is gonna be a lone pair of electrons on a very electronegative atom. And if you think about the charges interacting here, it's a partial positive charge with a partial negative charge, which again is the same as what we have in a dipole-dipole interaction, except again, the point is just that these are the strongest dipoles you can generate. So we give them a little bit of extra appreciation by calling them hydrogen bonds. We can take a look at a few examples of how they work. The most common example that is discussed, of course, is with water. So if you look at water, each molecule has two hydrogen bond donors, two hydrogens bound to an oxygen. Each water molecule also has two hydrogen bond acceptors, these two lone pairs of electrons. And if you draw another water molecule, one of these hydrogen bond acceptors is able to form a hydrogen bond with this hydrogen bond donor. But again, this is just the strongest of the dipole-dipole forces because it's still partial positive interacting with the partial negative charge. All right. Now, another important thing to know is that there are some molecules that contain either an acceptor or a donor, but not both. These molecules are capable of forming hydrogen bonds, 
but not by themselves. So an example you can consider is acetone. When you look at this molecule acetone, you can see that it has hydrogen bond receptors. It has lone pair of electrons on oxygen, but it doesn't have any hydrogen bond donors. You don't have a hydrogen bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So acetone cannot form hydrogen bonds by itself, but it can form hydrogen bonds with any molecule with a hydrogen bond donor, such as water. So again, to form a hydrogen bond, you need a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. Let's take a look at another example question. And this is similar to what you would see on the MCAT. They would ask a question along the lines of, how many hydrogen bond acceptors does cytosine provide in a CG base pair? Now, as you recall in biology, the different base pairs are adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. And you probably also recall an AT base pair has two hydrogen bonds, whereas a CG base pair has three hydrogen bonds. So here we have guanine on the left, and on the right we have cytosine. We also have the hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bonds, you need your acceptors and you also need your donors. And here are the hydrogen bonds that are being formed. And you can see there are acceptors and there are donors. And we're asking specifically about cytosine. So here, how many hydrogen bond acceptors does cytosine provide in this base pair? Within the three hydrogen bonds, you can see here cytosine's providing a hydrogen bond donor on the top, a hydrogen bond acceptor in the middle, and another acceptor on the bottom. So the answer you would say here is two hydrogen bond acceptors. All right, and those are the three types of intermolecular forces you need to know for LAMCAT. Now, going back to the comment that I said earlier, that generally we think of London dispersion forces as being the weakest, and then dipole-dipole forces, and then hydrogen bonds. There are some exceptions to this trend. Again, remember that the strength of London dispersion forces scales with the size of the atoms and molecule, and also that the intermolecular forces will determine the physical properties of the compounds. So you can see between a solid liquid and a gas, a solid must have greater intermolecular forces than a liquid, which has greater intermolecular forces than gases. And what you can appreciate here is that iodine is a solid at room temperature. Water, which experiences hydrogen bonds, is a liquid at room temperature. Since iodine is a solid, it means that iodine's London dispersion forces are actually stronger than the hydrogen bonds, the intermolecular forces in water. So again, just pointing out that occasionally you do see exceptions to the general trend of the strengths of the different intermolecular forces.